We stopped after the uh, Alpha blockers, and now we will start with the Beta Adrenergic blockers. Now, how do Beta blockers achieve their antihypertensive effect? Was it five minutes or more than five minutes? Mr. Ray? Are you going to be able to get back or are you going to be able to get back? Okay. الله حدينا للشباب في حدا من الشباب اللي فرغت وبيض الحمد لله يا طويل ما كان نازل طويل مش عارف وين انت دور على الاسم الصحيح اللي جاي وين اللي جاي اوكي So, how do beta blockers achieve their antihypertensive <laughs> Particularly if we use the beta 1 selective blockers. Please. Exactly. So, that will achieve a combined negative inotropy, neurotropy, and thromotropy. And that will reduce the cardiac output and accordingly will reduce the blood pressure. Right? But is that the only effect? Of course not, because as we said, there is a huge crosstalk between the sympathetic activity and the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, particularly that the secretion of renin is affected by the sympathetic activity. So on the chronic use, beta blocker could decrease the renin secretion, sit down, and that would reduce the peripheral vascular resistance and so will reduce the blood pressure. Okay, now, some, uh, we have discussed the three different types of alpha beta blockers we use in practice for hypertension. We said there's the beta-1 cardioselective, the combined alpha beta blockers, and the beta blockers with intrinsic sympathomimetic activity. Please refer to the previous lecture for differences. But I will get, uh, it's important to get to the practical comments. Now, First thing to remember for beta blockers is that they are first line anti-hypertensive drugs in, in patients with concomitant heart disease. So if you have a patient who has myocardial infarction and hypertension, the first drug to think about is beta blocker. If you have a patient who has cardiomyopathy and hypertension, the first drug to think about is beta blocker. Okay, that's how you think. There's uh, heart disease, then think about uh, beta blockers. So that's only when they are first, first line drugs. And the other thing is that for younger patients, it's usually preferred to start or to use the um, uh, beta blockers. And particularly because, as we discussed before, the sympathetic tone in the younger individuals is higher. So that's why it's preferable to reduce that. So that's why beta blockers are first line in young patients. Selectivity is lost with, with high doses. This was an exam question, right? Why is that important for you? Exactly. Because in asthma patients or patients who have airway hyperreactivity, uh, if you give beta blockers at high doses, do not think that if they are cardioselective, they won't have a side effect on the lung. Okay? So, if, um, if there is a need to use the beta blockers, even if you use cardioselective beta blockers, try to use the lower to moderate doses. Do not go to high doses. The last thing, and please remember this. Acute treatment is not that effective. Which means what? If I prescribed um, a beta blocker to my patient today, do not expect to have uh, a clinical 
uh, effect by, uh, I mean, in the next two to three days. Okay? Now, the important thing is to understand why. Why is it not that effective acute? Let's explain it. Okay. So, why is the acute treatment not that effective? We will explain it in this. Now, let's imagine this is the um, uh, cardiac muscle. And as we said, the, the major effect on the cardiac muscle would be governed by the beta-1 receptor, right? Okay. Now, the beta-1 receptors are under influence from the centers within the central nervous system, right? The sympathetic center. So, under Rick, under one of the the second bell, the forty foot from the side door. the central nervous system, particularly the centers within uh, the brain stem. Okay? So once there is a signal from the central nervous system, it will get to the beta-1 receptor and that will produce contraction. Okay? Understood? Alright. So let's imagine something else happened. We used a beta-1 blocker. As I said, nature does not like to be interfered with. So if you block something that's there, she will fight back. Okay, I mean nature. So if you block the beta-1 receptor, what could be the response by the heart? The heart will not like, will not like the blockage on the beta-1 receptor. No. Increase the number of receptors. Increase the number of beta-1 receptors on the heart. Okay? Because it thinks, okay, you are blocking two or three receptors, I'm going to express two or three um, in exchange for that. Okay? So it, it will try to do some sort of balance. And this is something called, in physiology and in pharmacology, the receptor up, up regulation. And that's why acutely, okay, you would expect that the heart will start upregulating the receptors after you introduce the blocker. But that's not the only part of the problem. The other part of the problem is that the central nervous system will also not like that. Okay? So it will start firing at a much higher rate Okay? and getting into much more, uh, or giving much more innervation to the heart. Thinking that I will increase the innervation, the heart is increasing the receptors, so block whatever you want. We're going to maintain the function. Okay? So this combination of the sympathetic overactivation and the receptor upregulation make the clinical effect acutely almost um, non-apparent. There's no effect. Okay? So whenever you try to use beta blockers, you have to think that it will take some time to get to the clinical effect, okay? If you measure uh, the blood pressure after one week and you see no change, that does not mean that the beta blockers are not working. Just give it some more time. That's the first clinical correlation. The second clinical correlation is related to this thing, which is the sudden or abrupt withdrawal of the drug. Will it be a problem or not? Yes. Exactly. Just look at this picture. This is what you're left with. If you remove this, there is this sympathetic overactivation, and there is this receptor upregulation, and you just remove the blocker. So you are leaving the heart with so much stimulation at a time. Okay? And that's why if you stop the drugs suddenly, that might lead to rebound hypertension. Okay? Because of this background of sympathetic overactivation and receptor upregulation. Okay, this is important. But the other important thing, and this is please important um, when you get to practice. If you have a coronary artery disease patient, 
patients who have um, some sort of um, atherosclerosis or something like that in their coronaries, okay? So they depend on a very fine balance uh, of the sympathetic activity and sympathetic tone within these vessels. If you suddenly block, uh, if you suddenly withdraw the beta blockers, you are leaving the heart with too much activation, but at the same time, very minimal blood flow to the heart. And as I said before, ischemia is defined as what? Decrease of imbalance. imbalance. There is an increase in demand and, and reduction in supply. supply. And this is what's going to happen. You are leaving the heart with too much demand, okay, because there is too much activation, but with less supply because of the coronary artery disease. So patients might die, okay, due to angina. So in practice, we care a lot about this second part rather than this. So in guidelines, they say they focus a lot on this second part. Do not suddenly withdraw beta blockers in coronary artery disease patients because you might kill them. Okay? Yes. Yes. Particularly in heart failure patients, we use uh, um, something common in practice. It's called uh, start low and keep slow for beta blockers in heart failure and have in heart failure particularly. Start low and keep slow. Start low with low doses to get to a gradual increase in the function. And keep slow because as I said, it will take time. In heart failure patients, it might take up to three months to get to a clinical effect of beta blockers. It's nice, so it's nice to remember. Start low and keep slow. Okay, side effects of beta blockers. Something to worry about is Yes, please. Yeah, but we have uh, plenty of other classes, right? So I'm not going to leave the patient for okay, three months with beta blockers and not doing anything. I'm going to give them the press inhibitors. I'm going to give them whatever classes we have. So major side effects. Let's just um, um, mention hypertension, bradycardia. All of these are explained, so I'm not going to go again over it. Fatigue and insomnia and sexual dysfunction. This is something common in exams. I don't know why, but whenever you hear sexual dysfunction and antihypertensive therapy, just remember it's a beta blocker. Block. Okay. Now, centrally acting sympathetic agents or sympathetics. Now, the function is on the alpha-2 receptors in the brain, so they will target the total function of the sympathetic system. So they will produce, uh, or they will reduce the sympathetic activity on both the heart and the, cart and the uh, vascular tree. So that's why you will get a combined reduction in blood pressure, reduction in cardiac output and peripheral resistance. The uh, one um, commonly used drug, um, I will say it in, pra in brackets. It's not commonly used, particularly in Jordan. Jordan does not use this drug too frequently. In the States, the neuro neurologists and neurosurgeons like to use clonidine, okay, at once, uh, at one stage, which is when the patient is having resistant hypertension, which means that you are using all the conventional classes of antihypertensive drugs, and there is no apparent response. So why I said neurologist? Because one major risk factor is stroke. So uh, one thing they learn is that once you get to a resistant hypertension to protect your patient from stroke, start clonidine. Why don't we use it here? Because it's expensive first. And the second thing, it's, it's a little bit hard to control because if um, uh, the patient might get into rebound hypertension if you suddenly withdraw the drug. And you now understand why that happened, okay? Because it's the same mechanism as what happened with the baby. Before we get into the next class, any questions? Good. The RAS inhibitors, and these are very important in clinical practice. We are talking about the ACE inhibitors, the AT2 receptor blockers, or the ARBs. We have the renin inhibitors. They are mostly experimental, currently at least. And we have aldosterone antagonists 
or receptor antagonists, like what we discussed about the potassium sparing diuretics, spinal gland. Okay? Now, I'm going to focus on the ACE inhibitors and AP2 blockers, receptor blockers. Now, the ACE inhibitors, these are the drugs most commonly used or available here. Now, important points about it. First, it's an ultimate second line antihypertensive drug. Okay? So whenever you, you're thinking about combination therapy, your first liners are what? <laughs> Diuretics, beta blockers in a certain type of patients, right? Um, the ultimate second line for uh, the antihypertensive drug therapy is ACE inhibitor. Because as we said, the major counter-regulatory mechanism for anything that changes in the cardiovascular system is the rest, right? So that's why you always think, okay, if it's not working, then I have to use a REST inhibitor. And that's why these are ultimate second line uh, inhibitors. Unless you have a patient with heart failure and post-myocardial infarction, then try to think about ACE inhibitors as, as a first line. Anyone remembers why? When we talked about heart failure, what did we say very particular about ACE inhibitors? Decrease the volume of the heart. It will decrease the exactly. We said that the cardiac remodeling, structural remodeling, okay, which is hypertrophy and dilatation of the heart, could be affected by the ACE inhibitors. It could be prevented, and that's why when you have a patient that you would expect there would be some sort of cardiac structural remodeling, think about using what ACE inhibitor. These patients are particularly the heart failure patients and is post myocardial infarction patients. So, always think about this. Any, any patient who leaves the hospital after a myocardial infarction uh, um, disease has three major drugs in his pocket. These are what? Or oh, four, sorry, let's say four. Just try to guess. Beta blockers. Beta blocker, as we said. AC inhibitor. AC inhibitor. Diuretics. No. No. What else is important for aspirin? I'm, I'm just changing the scenario. I'm not talking only about antihypertensive. But in general, any post MI patient leaves the clinic with four drugs beta blocker, ACE inhibitor, aspirin, and. Warfare. What? Warfarin. No. Why don't I give warfarin? Just think, what's the major risk factor? Atherosclerosis and cholesterol accumulation. And that's why they leave with a statin or any lipid lowering drug. So this is the formula. Always remember, whenever you see an, a post my patient, aspirin, lipid lowering drug, beta blocker is inhibitor. Okay? Now. Uh, now, for young patients, always consider starting with an ACE inhibitor. So now we have two drugs that are used mainly in young patients. These are the beta blockers and the ACE inhibitors. Now, please focus on this because this is the type of questions I'm going to give you. Now, why is it used in young patients particularly? And we try to avoid using it in the elderly, or we don't like to use it in the elderly. Now, the last report by the American Heart Association has found that there are certain populations or pa populations of patients, and these are particularly elderly and black patients, they have low renal uh, um, concentrations in their body. Okay? So think about it. If I'm not producing enough renin, right, then what's going to happen to the function of ACE? Decrease. It's, it's not going to be that effective. Because ACE needs the production of angiotensin 1 to convert it into angiotensin 2. And that's why in the elderly and black patients, ACE inhibitors are not that effective. Because they don't have, or they have low renin levels. Okay? Finally, or not finally, um, ACE inhibitors are mostly pro-drugs and they are converted in the liver into the active form of the drug. This is important in one 
scenario, which is what? Liver failure. Yes. Exactly. There is a um, liver failure or there is um, a liver dysfunction, so you try to modify the dose or not use it at all. And the most important thing, please remember, ACE inhibitors are contraindicated in pregnancy. Okay? This is a clinical malpractice. If you prescribe ACE inhibitors to a pregnant woman, because there is a lot of data that says it's fetotoxic. Okay? Do not use it. Side effects of ACE inhibitors, again, we will go to the hypotension part, and there is the hyperkalemia part, and I explained this in too, detail, too much details previously, so please refer to that. And there is the dry cough. Why does it produce dry cough? Bradykinin. The function of the bradykinin because of the accumulation of bradykinin. So we have another class or subclass in this category, and these are the ARPs, or the AT2 receptor blockers. And as I told you before, they carry no advantage over ACE inhibitors. They're actually much more expensive, except for one advantage, which is that they do not produce dry cough. And that's why, because we said the accumulation of bradykinin is related to the function of ACE. ACE. So if I'm blocking the angiotensin 2 receptor, how is that related to ACE? No relation. And that's why the ARPs do not produce dry cough. Okay? This is important for the patients who are non-compliant on the drugs to consider switching them to ARPs. But they have to have insurance or enough money. Okay. Oh, Mm. As I told you before, if the disease is the gun, the, um, what do we call it, the counter-regulatory mechanism, or whatever you want to call it, is the F-16. So we never leave them with one drug. We will, we will try to target both limbs of the equation. Okay. Calcium channel blockers. Again, just remember, the rapamil and diltiazem are considered what? Non-dihydropyridines, and they are used mainly in the field of... We just discussed them, right? We just talked about rapamil. They have major function on the heart. They inhibit the function of the heart, so they, that's why they are used in arrhythmia. Do we use them in hypertension? No. No. What we use in hypertension are the class of dihydropyridines, and these are the drugs that have almost no effect on the heart. Okay, almost no effect, and I would say why. Almost no direct effect on the heart, and they function only on the blood vessel. So they will produce some sort of vasodilation. Uh, forget about the examples, now the practical comments. As I said before, Books say that they produce an intrinsic natriuretic effect. Okay? And that's why they say there is no need to couple a calcium channel blocker with a diuretic. Now, this could be true, as I said before, because if you are vasodilating the renal arteries, that's, that will increase the renal blood flow, right? So the excretion of sodium and water will be increased, and that's why we consider them to have that you're ticket, but there is one no I said before. Almost 90% of the patients who start mm -hmm. using these drugs, the dihydropyridines, will come to you complaining of edema, mostly in their face and in their legs. Okay, and it's so troubling for them. Okay, um, I remember one patient said that she couldn't fit her shoes after one week of using the drug. Okay, so there is this edema after using the dihydropyridine. But the problem is, this is a different kind of edema from the natriuretic effect. So there is an increase in the, um, um, decrease in the blood volume through the natriuretic effect. But what happens with the use of calcium channel blockers, this is just for your interest, 
why it happens. There is some sort of imbalance in the equation of filtration and reabsorption at the level of the capillary. Do you remember this in physiology? Remember hydrostatic pressure, capillary pressure, and all these things, or cotic pressure? Cassian channel blockers affect this. They will reduce um, uh, the uh, reabsorption and um, increase the filtration at the level of the arterioles before the capillary, and that's why they produce some sort of fluid oozing and edema. Okay. Now, the second thing which is important, black people have a higher response to calcium channel blockers, and we said because of the high muscle, muscle mass in their bodies is higher, so their calcium requirements are higher, and that's why they respond to calcium channel blockers much more than the white people. Okay, so always consider starting with a calcium channel blocker. Okay, side effects. It's an antihypertensive, so the first side effect is hypotension. What else? Postural hypertension. Postural. Postural hypertension with the calcium channel blockers. Why? Peripheral dilatation. Okay, what else? Constipation. This is something you should always remember, that constipation is a major side effect of calcium channel blockers because, again, it will affect the muscle cells within the gut, right? If you block that, there will be reduced motility of the gut and that will lead to constipation, okay? Just try to link things together. Why I'm saying that and why I'm trying to explain things? Just imagine you haven't studied calcium channel blockers in details before the exam. And you got the um, answers, A, B, C, and D. Okay? Even if, you, if you, even if you did not memorize that calcium channel blockers will lead to constipation, try to break it down and see um, that, okay, calcium is involved in any small muscle contraction. If I block that, that will decrease the motility. The effect will be constipation. Things are simple. If you understand the principle, you do not need to memorize things. Okay? And the other thing is headache rather than emotional head tension. Headache is a major side effect of calcium channel blockers, particularly when you use them for the first time. And this is related to the cerebral um, um, blood supply. Okay? They complain of headache. Okay. The last class of drugs are the direct vasodilators. And it's so complex, okay? But I explained it step by step, you remember? That? Anyways, okay. Go back and read it. <laughs> what I explained before is that the direct vasodilators act on this kind of channel. You remember this? So, let's get back. As I said, these voltage-gated L-type channels open once there is what? Depolarization. There is another kind of channels, the potassium channel, the efflux potassium channels. If they are active, what's going to happen to the potential? Hyperpolarization, which means it will go further down, okay, even below the resting membrane potential. And that will make the activation of the calcium channel harder, right? So the direct vasodilators, the ones I'm, I'm going to discuss here, or the one I'm going to discuss, is a strong stimulator or opener of the potassium channel, hyperpolarization, which will lead to closure of the anti-calcium channels, and simply put, if you inhibit calcium entry, there will be no contraction, so there will be relaxation in the systemic vessels that will lead to decrease in the blood pressure. Right? Please. The calcium entry channels on the vascular small muscle cells are voltage gated, right? So they open once there is a depolarization state. Okay. Now, at one point, the cal there is another type of potassium channels, which are the efflux potassium channels, that once open will lead to a state of hyperpolarization, which means the uh, the potential will go down even below the resting membrane. So what's going to happen to the excitability of the cell? The cell will be less excitable. It 
will not get into depolarization state. And that means calcium channels will not be open. If these are closed, no calcium entry, and that means if I went back to the animation, it would have been much easier. If we have time, we will go back over it. Okay? Did you understand? The one drug I'm going to discuss here is hydralazine. Um, it's, um, it can be given orally or in an injectable form. Now, hydralazine has a very short half-life, and that's why if you want to use it, you might need to use it in the um, hospital settings. It's hard to use it at home unless you use the sustained release formulations of these drugs. Anyways, because it affects only the peripheral vascular limb, then you would expect that a major side effect would be the reflex tachycardia. And if a patient has reflex tachycardia, how do you prevent it? Use concurrently with a beta blocker. And finally, um, as we said, it's used in emergency hypertension because of the short half-life and you could, you could infuse it. And it has a major side not a major side effect, but something to know, which is a lupus-like syndrome. And patients might complain of arthralgias and myalgias, and this is a common exam question. Hydrolysine lupus likes to Okay. Hypertensive crisis. It's divided into two types. The hypertensive emergency and hypertensive urgency. What's common between them? High blood pressure. High blood pressure. There is an increase in the blood pressure and it's defined as an increase of more than 180 systolic over 110 diastolic and or. Okay? This is the hypertensive crisis. Now, what's the difference? One complaining, one without the complaint. So, emergency comes with an end organ damage. What should you look for when we say end organ damage? What are the organs to look for? Heart, myocardial infarction, brain, stroke, kidney, renal failure. If the patient comes with a very high blood pressure plus any of these things, then it's a hypertensive emergency. Is it important to differentiate? Yes, because what? The treatment will be totally different. I will focus on hypertensive emergency because we need to introduce one new drug, and that's the sodium nitroprusside. We have another drug which is the betalol, and that's, if you go back, it's a, a combined and a one beta blocker, so it's good. But people use sodium nit nitroprusside much more frequently. Now, as you can see here, the key for the difference between the two drugs is the onset of action and the duration of action. As you can see, the onset of action for nitroprusside is immediate. Well, it takes 5 to 10 minutes with levitinol. And the duration is 1 to 2 minutes with nitroprusside and 3 to 6 hours with levitinol. How does that make a difference for you as an emergency? Okay, let's talk about the onset of action. Nitroprusside immediately, you know, it gives you the first one, so it's a bit of action. So, you'd like to start with nitroprusside because it has a much more immediate effect. Okay, so this is a positive for that. Nitroprusside. But it's also a negative. Why? No, 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 not because of the short duration. The immediate onset of action also is bad because it needs monitoring. I cannot administer the drug uh, in the floor. I have, I might need to take the patient into the ICU, okay, to start the nitroprusside because it needs continuous monitoring. There's an immediate effect. Now, the duration of action is much longer with the with labitalone. So is that good or bad? Bad. Good. Well, I would say good. And that will go back and say it's bad. So it's good because, okay, I gave it, I gave it once and it, it's, it's going to continue for three to six hours. But why is it bad? I can discharge the patient. Exactly. I can never discharge my patient because I cannot predict what's going to happen after three to six hours. So I, I have to admit, uh, admit the patient for some time for monitoring 
and see what's going to happen, and then I can discharge. For nitro peroxide, it's one to two minutes. It's good because the unpredictability is not that big, but it's a problem. Why? Because it will go back so quickly, so I need to give it as a continuous infusion. Are you following? Okay. So once we get to a certain level of infusion um, and a certain dose, we have to stop because there is cyanide toxicity. Okay, so we might need to switch to other classes of drugs. Okay. All right. No. Uh, before we get to the to the clinical cases, I'm going to show you three cases, but. Um, حزنتوني عليكم من ذلك ترجع عيد لكم المثال. Okay. This is the vascular smooth muscle cell. And as we said that it's the major component of the uh, contraction of the vascular smooth muscle cell is the calcium entry. And the calcium entry happens through an L-type channel. Okay, there's a particular characteristic of this L-type channel is that it's voltage dependent. Why is voltage dependent or how is it voltage dependent? Well, let's go to the action potential curve. You see that when there's a depolarization state, okay, when the membrane potential is increasing, the calcium channels will be open and that will lead to calcium entry. And that's why it's voltage dependent. Once there is repolarization or reduction in the potential, what's going to happen to the channel? Close. Now, there is another channel here, which is the potassium channel, which is responsible for both the repolarization and the hyperpolarization. It just gets the potential down to more negativity. And once these are active, the calcium channels would be what? Inactive. So once there is a reduction in the calcium entry, less free calcium, there will be less contraction. Okay? Now, direct vasodilators, hydralazine in particular, is a drug that exactly comes and activates or opens the potassium channel. Okay? Inside your own. Good? Any questions? Doctor, the question. Please. If the calcium the contraction will the force or the duration of contraction? Or the intent? Uh, it's a very good question, uh, but it will take time to explain. There's something called calcium-related contraction, and there's another term in, in physiology, but it's out of the record again. It's called calcium sensitization. Okay? The cell will increase the intracellular calcium concentration up to a point, and then the stores will be replenished. Okay, so there will be, they will take the intracellular calcium and get them stored in the ER and uh, uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum. But what we noticed, and I did this experiment, that if you stop giving calcium, okay, at one point, the contraction will continue, even if there is no more entry of calcium. And if you stop it? No, not because of the storage. It's even when we measure the intracellular calcium. It's related to something called the calcium sensitization, and it's a function of a different pathway. It's particularly the myosin light chain phosphatase. So we are keeping the intracellular calcium concentrations steady, but we are increasing the myosin light chain phosphatase activity. And I explained this, right? Yes. I doubt anyone of you remember. Yes. <laughs> okay. Bye. Um, how my exam questions would be. Here's, here are three examples. 
And let me teach you something, how to read questions, and this is important for the US MLEs. Okay? Or any exam. Here's a case. Listen. Now, if you read things like this, it's very freaking boring and confusing, and you will not get anywhere. Okay? So what I usually do, okay, and this is an advice from me too. Try to do something called highlighting the key terms. Okay? Highlight the key terms in the case. So this is a long case. So I highlighted the key terms. Let's go back. First key term is usually the age and gender. Okay? So I highlighted a 64 year old man. Okay? Now, the past medical history should be highlighted because it's going to govern my answer. So I highlighted that. He has a history of heart disease. And I'm trying to be nice and easy on you, so I haven't defined what kind of heart disease. Okay? Now, he came to you into the ER and he is having difficulty breathing, or what we call dyspnea. Now, I highlighted that because it's the symptom. Now, examination reveals that he has pulmonary edema. Okay, and again, I'm trying to be nice, so I gave you the diagnosis. But in other cases, uh, I might say that he came to you and you examined his chest and you found crepitation. Okay, which is an indication of fluids in the pleural cavity, so pulmonary edema. Okay, now, another thing that I, you need to understand with my questions, particularly with my questions. Choose the best answer and not the right answer. Okay? Now, I want I, I to remind you of something. Some of you complained about the nitrates question in the exam. Okay? And came to me asking, okay, nitrates, of course the right answer was that nitrates will produce a positive inotropic effect. Right? Well, there's the key last time. What's the point? Anyways, the point is, with my questions, choose the best answer and not the right answer. Because I might give you two confusing answers, but one is much stronger than the other, so choose it. Okay? By the way, I'm not someone who deals with the statistics of the exam, so I, if I find one who answered the question in the exam, I will make it valid. It will go through. Okay? Because I like to highlight that one person who was able to answer. بس إن شاء الله يكونش تشير. طيب إذا the best indicated drug. Here are the choices. Spiral lactose, which is what potassium sparing diet. Pure semide, which is a loop diet. In the exam, I'm not gonna give you the names. I will give you the class. But this is just an example. Atinolol is a cardio-selective beta blocker. And enolapril is an ACE inhibitor. So you've got all these choices. Okay. I need someone from this group. Uh, right, Keep silent, please. Let's hear how other people think. Please, anyone has an answer? Yes, here is my why? Which is? Which is what? Allah man is So there is a fluid overload state, and she used here is my. In this group, anyone has a different opinion, the same opinion, whatever. Totally. In a lab, why? There is a history of heart disease. Nice. In this group, any other choices or? Spinal lactone is a potassium sparing diuretic. This is a loop diuretic. This is a cardio selected beta one blocker. And enolapril is um, uh, an ACE inhibitor. Any different opinion? 
Let's go. Okay. Oh. You will go with Asian Hefter in a letter. Let's go. مش عارف الايس انهاب التركيب بيعالج الكلام تمام طب حدا يعارض مجرد معارض دكتور اوكي سمر هاف ذا وات اتين لو باي اوكي دكتور اول رايت سو ذا بيست انسر هير اي فورجت هاو تو كلوريفاي مش بعد نو نو اتس نوت ذا انسر Hydrochlorothalidone. The answer here is furosemide. Now wait, why is it the best answer? So I will go back uh, to who said ACE inhibitor because there is a heart disease. I will highlight another key term here and it's this one. Emergency room. Okay? As I told you, all of these ACE inhibitors are orally taken. Okay? And when you deal with the emergency department and there is too much things to do, try to use the IV or injectable drugs. And besides that, as I said, the first line drug for hypertension plus fluid overload state is gersamide, which is a loop there. So here you can see in, in my previous exam, I gave you only one choice, and it was what? Loop diuretics. Diuretics. I said yes. diuretics. But in this exam, I'm not going to say diuretics only. I'm going to define the classes, and you have to choose the best one of them. Because potassium sparing is not the, the right answer. Hydrochlorothiazide or the thiazides are not the answer. It's the loop diuretics that I care about. Okay, next case. Balash. An 84-year-old lady. Was recently there. An 84-year-old lady was thrown or was recently. Please let's let's focus for a minute. You have only five minutes. Was recently diagnosed by a colleague or a practice colleague as a stage two hypertension. The problem is that 90% of you do not know the stage two hypertension. Right? More than 160. What is it? She has, okay, she has no comorbidities as of now, which means what? No diabetes, no heart diseases, no whatever, no comorbidities. This is important. The doctor decided to go for a combination antihypertensive therapy, and that's why, as I said, if you have stage 2 hypertension, start with combination therapy, most likely double therapy. Now see what I'm going to ask you. I'm going to list all the antihypertensive classes and I want you to choose the best indicated double, double therapy regimen. I don't know why it's not working. It's not. Okay. <coughs> Diuretics. Beta blockers. Alpha blockers. Sure. ACE inhibitors or ARBs. Calcium channel blockers. Centrally acting sympathomytics. Direct base dilators. I need two, and it's the best and not the right. If I say the right, then any one of them could be used. And by the way, let me give you something as a surprise. The 2013 report by the European Society of Hypertension said that there is no effect or there is no difference between all these eight classes of drugs on the uh, long-term mortality rates. They all produce the same effect. But we like to play with things to make to give you more examples. Okay? So that's why we give you indication. Okay, I need two drugs. The best combination. Beta blocker and diuretics. Wait. Hear how people think, because it might help you. As you saw now previously, we have three different answers and we understood how we answered the question. Go ahead. Beta blocker and diuretics. Why? Why? Because we can't use uh, alpha blocker alone. If we want to use alpha blocker, we should use it with diuretics and beta blocker. You see, double therapy, uh, and we start. We should start with diuretics in the first line of any kind of hypertension because it's the simplest and the most effective. Okay. So we use diuretics if we want uh, to use double therapy. Okay. Anyone from this group? Any different opinion? He said diuretics. Anyone from this group? Any different opinion? 
عادي يعني ممكن اشجع تحت تفضل واي كيب سايلنت When someone is talking, keep silent. Because I need to hear. Ali Sot. Cool. Go ahead. Why? Good. This group, you said no opinions? This group. No opinions? This group. Okay. The answer is... Diabetics. That's the first thing. Again, why? Go back to what we said. Step by step. Diabetics. In general, in general, are first line antihypertensive, particularly in the elderly age, the elderly age group, and particularly when there is no comorbidities apart from diabetes. Okay, always try to think of diuretics as a first line antihypertensive, and particularly another thing also. As you can see, I said she was diagnosed recently by a practice colleague as a stage 2 hypertension, which means what? She, she, she just has a new diagnosis of hypertension. So you almost try to start with something safe, effective, and cheap. Okay? So diuretics is an integral part of your combination. Do you understand why? Okay. The combination, the best combination in this case, I will argue, are calcium channel one. Okay, now, first of all, the, the, the most common combinations with diuretics are beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and ACE inhibitors. Okay, now, because this is an elderly, as I told you, elderly patients do not think about using ACE inhibitors or beta blockers. We reserve these for younger patients, right? So, for the elderly patients, the next line of treatment is the calcium channel blockers. Okay? So we excluded the ACE inhibitors and beta blockers. Now, your colleague said direct vasodilators, right? I'm trying to explain why direct vasodilators is not valid here. Again, direct vasodilators are reserved mostly, most of the time, for acute emergency hypertension. If I want to use them on patients uh, in the oral forms, I mean, to discharge your patients on oral hydrolysine, that's only when I get to a, a state of resistant hypertension. I have no idea what's going on, there's no response to triple therapy, then I might need to use uh, hydrolysine. So always think of these drugs. Hydrolyzine and clonidine as something fancy. And actually the ARPS, the angiotensin 2 receptor block. Something fancy, expensive, and uh, the doctor will feel, okay, yeah, I did a great job. I gave them a new class of drugs. Okay? Any opposition to my opinion here? Good. Here is another case. <coughs> I need an answer from each group. was admitted to the hospital as a case of acute myocardial infarction <coughs> following a coronary bypass surgery his blood pressure was 139 over 
95 on average of triple readings. So that means what? That diagnosis is made. When you do triple readings of blood pressure, that's me, that means there's diagnosis. That's to ex exclude what? The white coat hypertension. Okay? So, and his heart rate was 73 regular rhythm. You decided to go for a combination antihypertensive therapy. Choose from the following options the best indicated double therapy in this case. Again, these are all the options. Let's start here. I had a Ace and Hepzer. With him. Beta blocker and Ace and Hepzer. Here. What? Diastic and what? No, he's going to get the myocardial infarction. Ace and Hepzer. Diastic because it's a first line. Nice. Nice thinking. Beta blocker and Ace and Hepzer. Just like that. Here. Please. Say it again. Ah, why? Is already known. Good. The answers are, or the answer is, beta blockers and ACE inhibitors. It's simple. I reminded, as I said before, my cardiac infarction always think about these two. Uh, but I gave you clues in the, um, in the question to exclude other options. I will start with your colleague here. You know why I put 73 with regular rhythm? I put it because I wanted you to choose beta blockers. Now, beta blockers could be used with caution or carefully if the patient has bradycardia or irregular rhythm. Okay? So I put it as a normal heart rate with regular rhythm to encourage you to choose beta blocker. And I chose this 50-year-old man, so I gave it to you in the margin between young and old, again to encourage you to use the ACE inhibitors. Okay? So in general terms, yes, this is a direct case. Post-MI, think about beta blocker and ACE inhibitor. Okay? But to confirm your um, diagnosis and choice, it's a, a, a midline between young and old, so ACE is okay. Heart rate is regular and, and uh, um, normal, so choose the beta blocker. Now, with the diuretics, I would argue that it's another valid choice. Okay? But the problem is that the blood pressure is not that high. You see, it's in the margin of um, stage one. Okay? And we only, and that's why I put it this, this way. We only decided for a combination therapy because it's post-MI. You get that? As I said, prehypertension is treated by what? Lifestyle modification. Stage one is treated by lifestyle modification plus monotherapy. This was almost a stage one, but I chose two. Why? Because it's post-MI. Please. If he was a black man, huh? We might use the calcium channel blockers because he's, if he was um, um, black. But remember that you have to take care of the fact that you are combining two cardiac inhibitory drugs if you are using the verapamil or Gilgit. So do not use them together. But if you want to use dihydropyridine plus beta blocker, that's good. We're done. Um, uh, you don't have time for the next lecture. Please, no. Uh, the heart rate is in the 
the heart rate was irregular. Irregular, or there was a bradycardia.